But tonight, we, we're going to start, Carla's just written a book about the election of 1896 and uh, William McKinley, uh, which seems to be a little bit off subject, but I'm going to ask him first to talk a little bit about United States at that time, the end of the 19th century, because you'll see there are some eerie parallels to the state of the, the country today, and the character of McKinley then becomes a very interesting uh, character to bounce off by comparison to the current presumptive Republican nominee. So Carl, locate us uh, at the end of the 19th century place, if you would. Uh, it looks like today only worse. <laughs> American political system is broken. We have five presidential elections in a row in which nobody gets 50% of the vote. Everybody gets less than 50%. We have two presidents elected during this period who win a majority in the Electoral College but come in second in the popular vote. One of those elections involves a five-month-long dispute about the outcome of Florida. Third president gets elected with a majority in the Electoral College and wins the plurality of the popular vote nationwide by 7,000 votes. We have political gridlock because we have 20 years of divided government, two years of Republican dominance, Republican president, Senate, and House, two years of Democrat president, Senate, and House, and 20 years of political gridlock in which they hate each other's guts, not only because the parties have different views of, uh, of what the country ought to do. The Democratic Party is the party of states' rights, limited government, low taxes through low tariffs, and is busily extinguishing the right of black and white Republicans below the Mason-Dixon line to vote. In 1896, black majority states in the South include South Carolina, Alabama, and Louisiana. A majority of the eligible voters are black men, and the Republicans get less than a quarter of the vote in each of those states. The Republican Party is the party of a robust federal government with high taxes through high tariffs, and robust protections for the voting rights of black and white Southerners. They're still fighting the Civil War, and they hate each other's guts as a, as a result, and nothing gets done. Uh, I was reading a dry part of the congressional record on a debate on tariff reform in 1888, in which McKinley plays a key role of defeating a Democrat free trade measure, and the Republicans being protectionists at that time. And uh, when the de debate is finished, McKinley, by an adroit maneuver, gets the former Democratic Speaker of the House to join the Republicans to, to kill the Democratic free trade, trade measure. And a Democrat stands up and excoriates former Speaker Randall by name at the end, calling him Randall and his 40 thieves, the 40 Democrats who break ranks to support the Republican proposal and kill the measure. And during the course of it, he begins to excoriate one of the Democrats who serves as a teller for the no votes votes, the guy who counted the votes for the Republicans and the dissident Democrats, and he excoriates him in deeply personal terms, and the man stands up and protests under the House rules that this language is not allowed. And in the congressional record, they, it reads the following. He turns to him and says, I would not blank you if you were a dog. Now, <laughs> there are four ellipses there. They ellipsed it out. It's four letters. I've tried some combinations. You could try your own. But that was how antagonistic it was. The country is going through a disruptive period of economic change. We are changing from an agrarian country of artisans and farmers to a country with a modern industrial economy that is completely discombobulating to people. You think about the range of, and pace of innovation in our society, think about an age in which they create the electric light bulb, the automobile, refrigerated rail cars, uh, mechanical uh, machines that can make anything. Used to, you, you were the artist and you used to make it something, you made a pot by hand, and now you're competing with a machine that can make it better and quicker and more uniform than you could ever imagine. Farmers go from being concerned about, do, can I grow enough crops to feed my family and have a little bit to sell in my community, to what's the price of wheat gonna be affected by what happens with the Ukrainian harvest this year? What's going on with Argentinian beef sales? What's the cotton price gonna, happen when, when, when the crop comes in in Egypt. And people are completely discombobulated about where they fit in the economy. We're also undergoing a depression, the greatest depression that the country has faced between its formation and the Great Depression of 1929 or 1931, depending on when you want to say it began. And we're also changing demographically in a very profound way. 
We'd always been a nation of immigrants, but starting in the 1870s, less of the immigration came from the familiar places. Before 1870, immigration had been dominated by people from England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and Germany, and a little bit from the low countries and occasionally from France. Now we had strange people coming from across the globe. We had Ukrainian Jews and Polish farmers and Bohemian beer makers and Slovakian and Croatian miners and Portuguese uh, tanners and Spanish uh, potters and Italian uh, pasta makers and Greek fishermen, and they, were, and, and they had no connection to America because neither they nor their forebearers had been here during the Civil War, and as a result, they're totally disconnected from the political system. And they're increasingly not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, which is what the North had been dominated by, what the country had been dominated by. And this is incredibly discombobulated. Well, this, is, this is the second moment in America. When we began to have the Irish in the 1840s, we had the growth of the Know Nothing Party, virulently anti-Catholic, anti-Irish. Well, in the 1880s, a virulently anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant group is formed in Clinton, Iowa, and by 1895, 13 million Americans claim membership in the American Protective Association out of a country with 75 million people. It's the biggest pressure group in America, and it puts out a scorecard in every election. And in 1896, they declare every Republican presidential hopeful but one is acceptable to them. The one who's unacceptable is the maverick, modernizing Republican, William McKinley. And along comes an election, and it's one of the five big inflection points in American history, American political history. Political scientists have studied the election of 1896 uh, uh, for decades as one of the five great realigning elections. American politics is one way before the election of 1896 and distinctly different after. Much as it had been in the election of 1800 with Thomas Jefferson and the end of the Federalist era, and 1828 with the birth of the Democratic Republicans and the modern political system under Andrew Jackson, 1860 with Abraham Lincoln and the emergence of the Republicans, 1932 with FDR and the emergence of the New Deal Democratic Coalition, and the other election about which we do not talk about the guy who won it, McKinley, is the election of 1896, which ends this broken period of American politics and ushers in a 36-year period of Republican dominance in which Republicans run it all except for the White House for eight years when they break among themselves in 1912. And it is a coalition that is the traditional Republicans, blacks in the South, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in the North, and the industrial working class. Because McKinley in the 1896 election wins the blue collar neighborhoods, he carries New York City. He clears the working class neighborhoods of every major industrial city in the North. The 10 largest cities in America, nine of them go for McKinley. The 10th, New Orleans does not. And uh, it's a remarkable moment in American history and it is driven by a guy you know nothing about the 25th president of the United States, who turns out to be this election, look, it's not amorphous, anonymous forces working their way through our political system that generates the outcome. The outcome of this election is driven by an extraordinary individual in a story filled with twists and turns, worthy of some coked up Hollywood dry, uh, screenwriter, sex, violence, backstabbing, betrayal. Everybody has a cool nickname. Keep, keep in mind. Everybody has a cool nickname. The Democratic frontrunner for president is Richard Park Bland of Lebanon, Missouri, who for 20 years has led the fight for the free and unlimited coinage of silver, an inflationary currency. He calls it the cause of humanity himself, and his nickname is Silver Dick. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> but it, it, America does look like, like today, only, you know, in many respects worse. Um. You've located us in a, in a kind of an eerie parallel with the economic and the cultural situation. Talk to us about the similarities and the differences between William McKinley and Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, extraordinary, on the surface, some parallels, yeah. but yeah. then quite, quite different. Yeah, well, look, uh, not everything's exactly the same. McKinley and Trump are, are alike in a couple of ways. They're outsiders. McKinley takes on the bosses of the Republican Party. They call themselves the Combine. They write each other coded letters. They're led by the former New York U.S. Senator Thomas Collier Platt. His nickname is the Easy Boss. 
His, uh, his aide de camp is the boss of the Pennsylvania Republicans, Senator Matthew S. Quay. He doesn't have a nickname, only guy without a nickname. He's brilliant. Their, their, their chief operative is the publisher of the Des Moines Register, James S. Rhett Clarkson. I found one of the coded letters in Platt's uh, archives at Yale in which there were so many coded words used in this, in this letter that he pulled out his code book and wrote above all the code words what they meant. So Clarkson writes him and says, I need a pyramid this week and a pagoda next. I need $3,000 this week and $5,000 next week. Some things don't change in politics. <laughs> but McKinley takes on the bosses and beats them, becomes the first modern presidential candidate. He changes entirely the way the campaigns are run. You used to, before 1896, you would, you would express some interest in running, and you would, quote, leave your fate in the hands of your friends. And they would sort of get your home state and a couple other places to be for you. And you'd all show up at the convention. And, you know, you'd have a bunch of ballots. And the boys would get, back in the, get together in the back room, smoke cigars, drink brown drinks, and they'd arrive at some accommodation. I'll give you the Secretary of Treasury and all the patronage thereof. You're in charge of the post offices in the South. And you bring the delegates to us. And they nominated a candidate. And McKinley says, screw it, I'm not doing that. I want to go to the White House, he said, unmortgaged. So he shows up at the convention, having literally organized every state so meticulously that he walks in and becomes the first presidential candidate since 1872 in the renomination of Grant. Only three people have been nominated for president since the beginning of the party on, on the first ballot. John C. Fremont in 1856, because he was the only candidate. Ulysses S. Grant for re-election in 1872, and then McKinley in 1896. But they are enormously different in another way. McKinley is a unifier. He's a man of enormous personal integrity. He's a man, or, a man with an unbelievable war record. We honor JFK for PT-109. We honor 43 for enlisting in the Navy at the age of 18 and becoming the youngest torpedo bomber pilot. In April of 1861, 18-year-old William McKinley shows up with the men of the Poland, Ohio militia at Camp Jackson outside of Columbus, Ohio. Lincoln has called for 90-day volunteers. We'll put the rebellion down in 90 days. And so he and the men of the Poland militia, teenagers, show up, say, we're here. And they say, sorry, the enlistments for 90 days have been, the quota has been filled. Here's your choices. Enlist for three years or the duration, whichever is longer, or go home. And almost to a man, the teenagers of the Poland militia enlist, and McKinley is a private in the 23rd Ohio. Four years later, he is Major McKinley, having received three battlefield commissions for unspeakable bravery under fire, including two suicide missions. He is recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor, and he, is, uh, he, he tells his comrades, don't press the application, I was only doing my duty. Uh, the, the, second, the second suicide mission he sent on is really remarkable for the way it plays out. It's the Battle of Kernstown, Shenandoah Valley, September of 1864. The Union Army, the Army of the Kanawha. McKinley's turned into a very, I mean, he's 22 years old, but he's turned into an incredible staff officer. And he's a, he's a second lieutenant, excuse me, a first lieutenant. And he's an aide to the brigade commander. And Jubal Early's Confederates break out of the trees in a surprise attack and begin to melt the Union line. And the brigade commander orders the five regiments under his command to withdraw while they still can do so. And the order, however, doesn't get to the, to the 13th West Virginia, which is on the right hand of the Union line. They're in an orchard sheltered from the Confederates. And they don't know the Confederates are about ready to cut them off and chop them to pieces. So the brigade commander turns around finds the officer whom he can rely upon and says to Lieutenant McKinley, ride to the 13th West Virginia. This requires McKinley to ride in front of the Union line across diagonally across the battlefield, ever drawing closer to the Confederates as the Union line collapses behind him. He's on an active battlefield in front of the Union, the only guy on a horse in an open field. His tent mate, who later became General Russell Hastings, said it was a suicide mission. And they watched McKinley ride, it, ride into this maelstrom of shells going off and muskets being fired and smoke. A shell goes off near him, and they're afraid that he's gone down. But Hastings writes, out of the crowd of gray smoke came a small brown horse 
with the erect horseman. Somehow or another, McKinley makes it to the, to the 13th West Virginia, and just in the nick of time, they retire before they're cut off. McKinley rides behind the battlefield, behind the front lines, returns to his brigade commander's tent, walks in. His brigade commander turns around and is startled. His brigade commander, Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes, himself a future president, says, my God, I never expected to see you in this life again. And this guy becomes president, and he becomes president by being a unifier. He takes on the bigots by taking on the American Protective Association. He cultivates Catholic voters. No Republican president had ever been endorsed by a member of the Catholic hierarchy until William McKinley. He takes on the bigots in the South. He is the first presidential candidate of either party to openly appear before black audiences during the presidential primaries and ask for their votes. And he doesn't do so in the comfort of the North. He does it in March of 1895, first in Jacksonville, Florida, and then in Savannah, Georgia. And he's a unifier. He strikes a message that we're all in this together. Neither labor nor capital can be prosperous unless the other is prosperous. We cannot be prosperous unless we all have an opportunity of prosperity. And the obligation of our government is to provide the conditions in which all can achieve and all can strive and all can prosper. And he does so when confronted by a guy who sounds like Bernie Sanders. Uh, William Jennings Bryan is excoriating the money power and the idle holders of capital and the bloodsuckers of Wall Street. And there is McKinley saying to the working man, we're all in this together. And it really is a remarkable campaign. So that puts us, oh, Lincoln Park. That puts us um, in an interesting position to, to look at what's happening today. You, you say at the end of your book, when you analyze why McKinley won, uh, you say politics is a game of addition. And his opponent, William Jennings Bryan, played a game of subtraction. Um, McKinley managed to bring in immigrants, Catholics, so on and so forth. He also increased the Republican vote by 37%. Why do I not feel this is going that way this time? Yeah, because it ain't. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a remarkable difference, because McKinley is a unifier. And, and unlike the candidates today, he, he, he only once or twice, I've read all of his speeches, and he gives a lot of speeches. This is the famous front porch campaign, where literally 750,000 people get on trains and come to Canton, Ohio. And there are only one or two points in which he says something angry or untoward, w William Jennings Bryan. Treats him with enormous respect. But he instead finds a way to talk about the issues in a way that draws people to him. And the issue of the day is an issue that we find hard to understand, which is currency. He was in favor, reluctantly, of a gold currency, which meant you know, the currency of Wall Street. And we were, we were a developing country. We were dependent upon foreign investment. And all the major industrial economies of the world, Germany, France, Britain, they'd all become gold economies. And, and Brian wanted a silver inflationary currency. The value of silver meant that the size, of, the size and shape of a silver dollar would contain 50 cents worth of silver. And the size and shape of a gold dollar would contain a dollar's worth of gold. So what would happen in that case? People would hoard the gold, they'd spend the silver, and prices would jump in order to adjust to the fact that you're paying with a silver dollar that was worth half as much as a gold dollar. And what would also happen is it would wipe out savings and it would lower debt. That was the main thing was, I mean, I have to admit I have a certain uh, affinity for uh, Midwestern farmers. If you had a farm and with no mortgage, you were in great shape. But if you had a mortgage, we didn't have our modern financial system. Mortgages were only available from specialized companies, generally insurance companies. So this is an era in which of deflation, so inter real interest rates are near zero, near one or two percent, and the average farmer, if you had a mortgage, was paying between eight and 14 percent. So I understand why, the, why farmers with mortgages wanted to depreciate the currency. But McKinley finds a way to talk about this issue in a way that working people can get their hands around. He's helped by two people. One is the former head of the Knights of Labor. The mayor of Scranton, Pennsylvania, gives a speech in which he endorses McKinley, a prominent labor leader, and he says it's because the working man deserves to be paid an honest dollar for an honest day's worth of work. He's also helped by an overly ambitious failed New York politician 
who gives a speech in which he says, here's a full loaf of bread. This is what an honest dollar will allow the working man to, to, to purchase. And then he pulls up a half, a half a loaf of bread and he says, this is the loaf of bread that the working man will get with a silver dollar. The, 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 the working man deserves to have a full loaf of bread. Uh, you may have heard of this ambitious politician. He's a complete weasel in the election of 1896. He doesn't like McKinley. He, he poses him. And uh, he's supporting Thomas Brackett Reed, the Speaker of the House. He writes his sister a letter saying, uh, just after McKinley wins the nomination, he says, we have a good platform. Quote, McKinley is a good man, but he is weak, and I worry about him in a moment of crisis for our country. And several days later, he writes some of McKinley's closest personal friends and says, we must do everything we can to elect McKinley. And when he is elected, you must be the Secretary of the Treasury or the Minister to France, and my ambitions, such as they are, can go by the wayside, which is his way of saying, God dang it, I need your help. I want a job. And he spends the next five months ingratiating himself into McKinley's good graces. He is a complete weasel. He invites this couple that are close friends of McKinley's to his house and, and takes the wife out in a rowboat and says, I'm desperate. I have no political future in New York. I'm on the outs with the machine. I ran for mayor and I came in third. There's no way I'll ever have a political future. The only way to resurrect my political ambitions is to go to Washington. And McKinley doesn't like me, but he likes you. And so put in a good word for me. He's then invited by a friend of his who's a United States senator to go on a speaking tour in western New York, which is a battleground state. And he gets up there, and his friend, who's a United States senator, says, come on with me, and I'll, I'll, put, I'll have you do some speaking. And I've looked at all the headlines from all the newspapers. For five days, they travel north, north, uh, western New York, and every headline, the failed New York City politician is the guy who gets the headline because he stands up and says the ugliest possible things you can say about William Jennings Bryan while, while his friend, the United States Senator, is saying, we must have a stable currency, and we must have a currency that attracts the credit worthiness of the, of the international community. And this young politician is saying, Bryan is a demagogue. And he is an untrustworthy anarchist. And he would take from the rich in order to give to the, uh, to the idle and the, th and, the, and, the, uh, and the unworthy. And he gets all the headlines. At the end of this five-day tour, the two men go to pay, to pay respects to McKinley. And their mutual friend, John Hay, Abraham Lincoln's personal secretary, writes his neighbor, Henry Adams, and says, H and T have gone to McKinley to bear their tummies and commit Harry Carey in front of the major. He knows what McKinley thinks of these two guys. And he says, McKinley invited me to watch the spectacle, but I didn't want to join the mob trampling his lawn. At the end of the campaign, this kid has gone out, a young kid, he's in his 30s, goes out and gives the nastiest speeches possible about William Jennings Bryan. And at the end of the campaign, when McKinley wins, his pals go back to McKinley and say, all right, look, election's over. You've got to fill the government. This kid's a bright young kid. He's sort of your kind of guy. He's a modernizer. He believes in a reformed Republican Party. We know you don't like him, but is he, he's just the kind of guy you ought to promote. He's got a future, but only if you rescue him from obscurity. And he doesn't want a job in the cabinet. It's a job in the sub-cabinet that he wants. Nobody's ever held it before. There's nobody really interested in it. Give him a shot. And McKinley says, okay, I will. But, quote, I do not trust your young man, Roosevelt. He's too pugnacious. Carl, um, tell us about Donald Trump. How did he get into this position? And where is he going to go? He's one lucky son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, look, he, first of all, he read the mood. Rightly or wrongly, he read the mood, which was inside the Republican Party, we have a group of people who are not particularly ideologically motivated. These are not people who read Hayek and they don't subscribe to National Review and they don't go to the Conservative Political Action Conference and you know they, they, they're, they're, they're more likely to describe themselves as moderates than very conservative, which is, doesn't mean that they're moderate in the sense of their views, it just means they're disconnected to the political system and it's the easiest, convenient, acceptable label. And they don't, have a, they don't collect much in, as much information as the partisans on either side do, but they're angry about the direction of the country. They think the country's going to hell in a handbasket, and they want somebody strong who will take a brick and promise to throw it through the plate glass window. And they look at the Republicans in the House and the Senate, and wrongly in my opinion, but rightly or wrongly, they look at them and say, I expected you, we sent you there in 2010, you should have stopped this son of a bitch. 
and we sent you there in 2014, and you should have changed everything, and you haven't, and so I'm upset with you. And I want somebody who will promise me that they'll change. And he grabbed that spirit. Does anybody, do you think the ordinary cat says, oh, yeah, Mexico is going to pay for that wall? I, I don't think so. <laughs> but I think what they, in political science, we use a term called heuristic. And I think they look at that and say, that guy's concerned about what immigration is doing to our country. Uh, do, you, do you think they really believe some of the things that he says? No, but I think they say, when he says, you know, I'm going to tear up the trade deals and I'm going to, if you take your, if you take your company to Mexico, we're going to charge you a 45% tariff. Do you think they really think he's going to be able to do that? No, but they say he cares about jobs and we're getting kicked around by the world and not properly respected and, you know, he'll do something about it. Um, Are we taping over here? We're, there we go. Should we're being, look, smile to the camera right oh, there. Oh, good. Um, he's facing an, uh, an equally flawed candidate on the Democratic oh, side. Oh, yeah, sure. How do, we, how do we Bernie, get there? Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders and, and uh, Donald Trump have roughly the same percentage of the vote in their primaries. F Donald Trump is 40.2% so far. I think uh, Bernie, the last number I saw, is like 41-something or other. But, but we, have, we have an equally flawed Democratic candidate. Six out of every ten Americans think that she's dishonest and untrustworthy. I looked this morning, 54.9% in the real clear politics average think that uh, give her negative uh, feelings. 60, or 60, I'm sorry, 59%. 64 think uh, give him unfavorable numbers. So, I mean, we've never nominated candidates for president who had numbers that high. I mean, it's just, it's jaw-droppingly bad. And we're likely to end up in a general election in which people say, I'm choosing between the lesser of two evils. There'll be partisans on both sides who'll say, yeah, I'm really excited about my candidate, but the proportion of the electorate that feels that way is significantly less than we've seen in any modern election. So pull back for a moment, if you would. You mentioned earlier the five elections uh, after which America had changed, uh, was different after than it was before. Is this, for negative reasons, if you like, going to be a similar election? Clearly, at least the Republican Party is going to be completely restructured. Yeah. Well, both parties are. I mean, think about this. Well, there's a revolution going on in the Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders stands up and says, in Iowa, I'm leading a political revolution. And he should be, I mean, he should be out. Should be out. But he raises $42 million in February without holding a single fundraising event. And then he turns around and in March raises $44 million without a single fundraising event. I mean, the guy, the guy is not the typical politician. And the things that he's advocating are not the typical things. I mean, look, think about this. Think, this is weird. I was with Howard Dean, <laughs> little yeller, uh, <laughs> old yeller. Uh, so I was talking to Howard. I said, do you know him? He says, oh, yeah, don't like him. I said, why? He said, well, think about this. He was elected mayor of Montpelier, excuse me, of Burlington in the, in the 70s or excuse me, the 80s, ran for governor in 1988, got elected to the U.S. House in 1990, and is now in his third term in the United States Senate. And in every one of those elections, he defeated a Democrat in order to get elected. He has never run for office as a Democrat. This will be the first Democratic convention that Bernie Sanders has ever attended. <laughs> it's sort of like the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. You know, the, the sort of they hated each other worse than they hated the czar. And that's what we got here. The, he, he's, he's dis, I mean, he's never gone to a, a, a Vermont Democratic Convention because he's not a Democrat. And yet he's in, the, he's in the hunt. The only reason, I mean, think about it. He's like 1,400 to 1,200 in the elected delegates. But they, got the, you know, they may be the Democratic Party, but they got the House of Lords, the super delegates. 712 of them. My friend Donna Brazil, I was with her this morning in Vegas. I'm going to be in, in uh, San Francisco tomorrow with her. She was elected as a superdelegate to the 2016 convention in 2001. <laughs> and the only way you're no longer a superdelegate is if you die or give it up. So it is the House of Lords. And they are now 520 for Hillary to 40 for Bernie. And I have it on good authority that Debbie Wasserman Schultz knows the exact location of those 40. Squads of Democrats are closing in on them. They'll round them up, and they're going to be shortly at a re-education camp in Eastern Oregon. <laughs> so, but they, both parties are in disarray. I mean, it's, and again, it's like 1896. 
Both parties break apart in 1896. The Republicans have a walkout. The delegates from Montana, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming walk out of the Republican National Convention. And the Republicans lose one of the most Republican states in the country over the silver issue, Kansas. They lose Nebraska, one of the most Republican states in the Union. They lose barely one of the more Republican states in the Union, South Dakota, all over the issue of populism. And the Democratic Party splits. The silver men, the, the populists, grab control of the party apparatus, and the sitting Democratic president is repudiated by name in the Democratic platform and excoriated on the floor of his own convention. And he ends up supporting a fourth party. There's the Populist Party, the Democrat Party, the Republican Party, and then a, and a I'm sorry, the Silver Party, which are mostly Republicans, and there's an, a gold Democratic Party that, that is supported by the sitting Democrat President of the United States. Democrats, though, they were, were no longer possible of splitting that many ways, but, but the Democratic Party is facing similar challenges after this election, regardless of who gets elected. It's worse for the loser, but each party is, is undergoing a stress and a strain that's going to be interesting to watch in the years ahead. So I've been traveling a lot recently, particularly in Asia. We have this Asia conference in September. And, you know, going back to December, everywhere I go, people ask me about Trump. We're burning through batteries big time here. Um, going back to December, people ask me, so surely Trump's not going to be the uh, nominee. And I say, no, no, the Republicans, they'll fix it. Watch. Um, <laughs> and as, you know, got into January and February, I was not so confident in that position. Um, now, I, I can't even say, well, I don't even think he's going to make the White House. Uh, yeah. Is there a path for Donald Trump to the White sure, House? Sure, absolutely. Look, th this is not an accident. These polls that are coming out this week in battleground states, he's consolidating the Republicans, are probably a little bit richer than it should be. But look, anybody who tells you they know how this election is going to play out is kidding themselves. Because, look, he... He's going to be helped by the fact that Republicans are animated in their opposition to Hillary Clinton. They're going to be helped by the fact that she is not going to be able to reproduce the Obama coalition exactly the way that he did. I mean, African American turnout is not going to be as elevated as it has been, nor is she going to get the 97 to 3 that he was getting. But anybody who knows how this election is going to turn out is kidding themselves. He's, he has thrown out the rule book, and anything can happen. And, um, but like you, I travel some abroad, and I'm, you know, it's not just Donald Trump. They're worried more generally about the United States. I was in Norway. I'm Norwegian-American, so when I go to Norway, I have a certain cachet that gets me lots of aquavit and lutefisk. Uh, but I was in Norway, and uh, I, my hosts are sort of, were, were, uh, I hosted a lovely dinner party for me. So I'm sitting there, and it's summer, and of course the sun never sets, and we're sitting there, and the former defense minister and the mayor of Oslo, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, it started about 6 o'clock, and when it finished, I said to my wife, that was the fastest three hours I've ever been at for a dinner party. And she said, honey, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> of course, you couldn't tell because of the sun. So anyway, we're sitting there during dinner, and one of these guys starts going on me. And he says, uh, does America get it? Do you get it? Does the American leadership get that it's 1958 and we're back in the Cold War? We have Russia uh, menacing our northern border. There's a shared border between Norway and Russia. We have Russian aircraft testing our air defenses. We have Russian submarines in our territorial waters and those of our neighbor Sweden. Does the United States of America get it? And where are you? And I said, don't blame me. You're the, you're the sons of bitches who gave him the Nobel Peace Prize before he even took office. <laughs> Which, of course, unsettled you. Know, it, was, it was that Labor member of the parliament, and there's a special commission, and I mean, set them off. But I, I get this everywhere. I mean, I, I, I was in uh, Europe recently, and I met with, uh, I was meeting with the number two guy in the government, who's a very pro American guy, and five minutes into our luncheon, in walks the number one guy who sits down and wants to pick our brains about American politics and so forth, and uh, America's leadership. and. He was part of the group that in NATO that kept, kept us in Afghanistan longer than the President Obama originally had intended. And so I complimented him on that because he brought up Afghanistan. How did the American people feel about the Afghanistan mission? And I said, they, they don't, they're against it. I said, they're totally down on it. They don't care about it. They don't listen to it. They're not in favor of it. And I said, but thank God you let us to stay there because, you know, it's vital that we remain there. He said, well, why don't they 
Why aren't they in support of it? I said, because we never talk about it. Our president never explains the stakes, as you've done to your people, in order to maintain your parliamentary majority. Our president doesn't have a parliamentary majority, so he feels no necessity to talk about the stakes. And the guy says to me, basically, can I trust the United States to be a reliable ally? I got an even more point. I met with a young, with one of these young Saudis. I don't even know what the guy does. Well educated, educated in Britain, speaks fluent English, really smart, clearly Western in orientation, and he was asking about American politics. So we go through everything, and you know, I mean, the guy was well educated on American politics, but he wanted to know the minutia. So at the end of it, we were just sort of, you know, sort of closing out the conversation, talking about the future, and he said, "Congratulations! I want to congratulate your country." He said, you have achieved in the Middle East the impossible. You have achieved the unthinkable in the Middle East. He said, you've convinced the state of Israel and the kingdom of Saudi Arabia both that you're an undependable ally. <laughs> so we, we, we have a major problem. And the next president, whoever he or she is, is going to have to deal with it. Uh, because the world is desperate, as you know, when you go abroad. I mean, they, they, they may bridle at America, but they're desperate for our leadership. And if we don't pay attention to something, uh, the world loses attention on it. Um, if we don't make it a priority, nobody else will make it a priority. If we are not willing to commit our energy, our effort, our treasure, and our leadership, then nobody else is either. Let's get some questions from the floor. We have a microphone here. Just put your hand up, and Alexander will get we you. We can't guarantee the batteries, but so shout loud if it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, you may have to shout. Uh, you mentioned that 1896 was a transformative year in terms of presidential elections and for the Republicans. What happens after 2016 to the GOP if Trump loses? If Trump loses, I think there gets to be a war for the heart of the Republican Party, some introspection. What, what of, what, I think the ultimate question will be, what good is there to be learned from Trump and what must the party do to modernize itself? So we'll be, and how we resolve that will be interesting to watch and ugly. But I think, I think one thing that t Trump has tapped, which is why he's unreliable to say he can't win or that he will win, he has touched the spirit of American nationalism. People look at him and say he wants America to be great again, whatever that is. Put your own definition of it in there. But he cares and loves America. And we want that in a leader. Now, I'm, not, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm a free trader. I think these mercantilist ideas that he's evinced with regard to trade are economically ignorant and, and politically disastrous uh, for our country and the world. But the Republicans are going to have to come to some program of action to deal with that if he loses. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see it all play out. You know, We've had a battle going on in the Republican Party for essentially the last eight years, which has been, um, if we only nominated a true conservative, we'd win. And we'll see a little bit of that pop back up, but there'll be there'll be even more soul searching. I think one if he loses, one reason will be because we have alienated Latinos and not made the inroads with Asian Americans that we should make, and we have not made begun to make inroads in the African American population, and we will have not as done well among young people as we should, and all that's gonna require us to rethink what we do and how we do it. Um Two things. One, that uh, Vice President Dick Cheney obviously said that he would vote for whoever the nominee is. And uh, President Bush, of course, said he won't. Where do you stand? And also, uh, Brett Stevens has come out and, and absolutely excoriated yeah. Trump. And I asked him a question the other day. I said, just say yes or no. Would you vote for um, Hillary Clinton? And I said, thereby, you know, uh, and he said, yes, he would. And I'm finding that a lot of people are, people I know that are really, really conservative are ready to vote for Hillary. How is it possible that the Republican Party can go for someone like that and just walk away and, and not put country first? Well, first of all, uh, they don't have a nominee, a prospective, a presumptive nominee who has the moral authority to say, come with me, let's unify. He's not labored in the vineyards loyally for years. He voted for John Kerry in 2004. 
In 2006, he called for the impeachment of George W. Bush. I think that's maybe one of the reasons why President Bush is not supporting him for election. <laughs> he, supported, he supported Hillary Clinton in 2008, wrote her checks to her campaign, and, and after she lost, only reluctantly endorsed uh, John McCain on September 17th in a TV interview in which he said, well, I think he's going to win, so I'm going to vote for him. So this is not a guy who's been out there, you know, traveling the country saying, by God, I'm, I'm, you know, I was there in 2006 trying to elect, you know, so-and-so senator. And I, I was out there speaking at the Lincoln Day dinner in Sangamon County, Illinois. And by God, John K I, went, I joined John Kasich on the campaign trail. I hosted fundraisers for Republicans. This is a guy who's given money to Harry Reid, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, Ted Kennedy, and in 2006, his largest contributions were the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee to elect Nancy Pelosi speaker. And when she was elected speaker, he was so enthusiastic, he wrote her a congratulatory message on the front of one of the New York tabloids, and she was so pleased with it that she had it framed and hung in her office. So it's hard for him to make the case that the normal Republican could make of, I'm the nominee, let us all join together and march on to victory. And uh, and then you put on top of that, look, I'm, I'm, I know Brett Stevens. I don't want to get in an argument with Brett Stevens. That guy's got a brain about as big as his room. And he feels strongly about it, and I understand that. I'm not voting for Clinton, but I can understand somebody who would say, I've made, taken the measure of him and taken the measure of her, and she's the lesser of two evils. I can understand that. But he did support Mitt Romney. He did support Mitt Romney, yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but how about 2008, 2004, 2006? 2000. In 2000, he supported Al Gore for president. That was because he was grateful for him for, inter for inventing the Internet, which is <laughs> very important to Donald's businesses. He has Wi-Fi at all of his resorts. Do you see a third-party bid this year? No. Very simple reason, May 9th. If you want to be on the ballot as an independent candidate in Texas, you had to submit 80,000 signatures, your vice presidential running mate, and your, and your team of electors by 5 p.m. Monday afternoon. By the time the Republicans meet in uh, Cleveland, 11 states will have passed their deadlines. Michigan will join them, the 13th state, on the 21st of July. You, you can't, as a conservative, expect to run for president and say, well, I'm not going to be able to get the, 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 the electoral college votes of the most conservative big state in the country. Would you like to be chief of staff? No. <laughs> I was the deputy chief of staff and senior advisor, and I had a lot of fun. But I had hair, and it was, gr it was not great when I took the job. Um, yes, my, uh, my question is in, in regards to some of the, the acts of kind of actual violence that we've seen that have come out of these things. And I'm curious, I, I guess my concern would be, you know, when, when you rile up a certain base, you know, this is an intelligent room, and... And, and folks here might understand that some of these promises aren't possible, you know, that you're not going to make Mexico pay for a wall, that the wall's even possible. What happens if he does come to office and can't make good on any of this? Is, is, is it something that people are just going to let that go? Or are you looking at a real issue? Yeah, look, um, I, I, I think that's a problem. I think the next president's going to face a problem because I don't think the next president is going to go into office, regardless if it's Trump or Clinton, with a mandate that's positive in nature. They're going to go in with a mandate where people say, I voted for them because pff, the, other, the, other, the alternative was worse. And that's not constructive for a democracy like ours. And yeah, but you, you, an interesting question. I mean, again, I'm not certain that it's going to affect the people who support him. Because when he says build a wall and make Mexico pay for it, I don't think most of the people authentically think, A, he's going to build a wall. First of all, I'm from Texas. Now, we're simple down there. We're not sophisticated like you Californians. We're not erudite and worldly. We're just sort of simple country folk. So the question I have is, on the 1,264-mile border of Texas and Mexico that is the Rio Grande River, where are we building the wall? M middle of the river? North side of the river? Sort of, we can't water our cattle in the river? Those two big reservoirs that we now use for recreation, and water impoundment, we can't get there? I mean, how big is the wall going to have to be in Santa Alina Canyon, 150 miles in the Big Bend, where the U.S. border is 1,500 feet up in the air, and the Mexican border is 500 feet up in the air, a sheer canyon for 150 miles? Where, how far, how high is the wall going to be? 
I'm, I'm, I'm on a few questions. Uh, Mr. Rove, you write uh, a column in the Wall Street Journal from time to time. Every stinking Thursday. <laughs> what do you mean from time to time? There, <laughs> I'm upset you hey, don't read it religiously, man. I, I, I read them all religiously, thank you, thank believe you. it or not. And I like the way you analyze everything and you have your act together because you give numbers. There was an article uh, about two, three weeks ago about a very interesting scenario that compared a scenario that happened during the Eisenhower time, where the writer, and I forgot his name, had uh, three people in the military that could come in from outside and win this election. And uh, yeah. did you read it, that? Yeah, I did, of course. Thank you. It wasn't you. on Thursdays, though. So well, I got to it a little bit later than I normally read the paper on Thursdays. Can you comment on that? Yeah, no, look, first of all, it's not going to happen because we're too late. But his suggestion was, you know, David Petraeus, uh, actually his, his final suggestion, the sort of the culminating one, is a pal of mine, Bill McRaven, who's the president of the university, or is the chancellor of the University of Texas system and was the head of special operations and is a terrific individual. He was in charge of special ops, uh, uh, and he was the guy who gave the order to go on uh, the mission on Abbottabad. But look, uh, it's funny you should bring that up, because I commend to you a book, not written by me, uh, but I've been reading it recently, rereading it. One of my Wall Street Journal colleagues wrote about it, Gordon Krovitz wrote about it. It was written in 1962 by the great uh, historian Daniel Borston, who later became the Librarian of Congress, and it's called The Image, uh, the History of Pseudo-Events in America. And one of his theses is that increasingly because of the changing nature of the American media and the American economy and the American political system, that in the future, this is written in 1962, in the future we would be less likely to place a premium in selecting a president on people who have either served in the military or have demonstrated experience in the act of governing and that we'd be more inclined to pick celebrities because they were famous. Now it took us 50 years to get there, but it's a really interesting thesis. And look, think about it. One of the great things I think about the election of 2014 was the large number of, we, we have a declining number of people who actually have served in the military who serve in the United States Congress. And yet, in 2014, Senator Dan Sullivan of Alaska, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, Senator Joni Ernst of, of, uh, of Iowa, and I'm leaving out one more, were, are all, are, were all elected to the Senate who are uh, military veterans. And I think that's a, con a healthy thing for our society. We have uh, children and grandchildren who are uh, paying for Social Security and Medicare and with no predictable uh, scheme as to whether they're actually going to benefit from it. And the baby boomers, which I'm one of, I think have made a mess of this political process this year. At what point do the millennials really begin to take over? Because the economy is going a different way. It's not, it's not where we are. Yeah, well, first of all, um, you say they don't have an idea of what they're going to get. They do. Nothing. Uh, they actually will get something. Social Security, actually when they wrote Social Security, they thought about what would happen if they exhausted the trust fund. So they put in statute a mechanism for that moment, which the actuaries say is coming in 2032. And what will happen then is overnight Social Security checks will be cut in order to match the income stream, which means that overnight people will have their checks cut by 24 percent, the current projection is. Now, I'll be 83 or 81, 82, 82 that year, and I'll be drooling a lot, but, but I, it's not going to affect me because I know what's going to happen, but can you imagine what would happen if we got to that moment and people overnight who depended upon Social Security for their life, you know, for their, for their life, saw their checks cut by a quarter. Now, I say that's good because at least we know what's going to happen. There is no similar description in the Medicare Act passed in 1965 of what will happen when the Medicare trust fund goes belly up and the hospital portion of it goes belly up in 2030. And the reason is is because the average two couple, a two wage earner couple will put in roughly just less than $120,000 in Medicare taxes over the course of their career and take out $330,000 in benefits and pass the 200 and 
$10,000 onto their kids and grandkids on their credit card. Uh, that's why I'm so concerned about both of these people who are running for president. One of them says that he will not touch Social Security or Medicare, and the other one wants to expand Medicare by allowing people age 50 or 55 to buy into a system that's already going belly up, only, only speeding forward the date that it would go belly up. And that's why I really admire Paul Ryan, because Ryan recognizes we're headed for a fiscal crisis, and the best thing we can do is to use the available time we have in order to make these programs sustainable for the long haul so that people who depend upon them can depend upon them. That means means testing. You know, Social Security, we give the same benefit, nearly the same benefit to Warren Buffett that we give to the guy who was a truck driver. And he's got a lot more assets. And we need to change these, both of these systems before it's too late. And in my opinion, we've wasted the last eight years. We better do something in the next four to six years. Or we're going to think about this. This president gets elected and serves two terms. We'll leave office in 2024, six years before Medicare goes belly up. And there's no amount of money that we can raise in six years that's going to solve that problem unless we change the structure of Medicare and Social Security. Yeah, and you know what? The, the younger voters don't think they're going to 40, I think it's 40 percent, don't think they're going to get anything out of Social Security. They'll get something. But, but look, I, let's also be clear. The millennials are, they're also the ones flocking to Bernie Sanders because he says free college. So when you're youthful, you know, what's that old saw about? If you're young, you've you got to be a liberal. If you get to be older, you get to be conservative. Well, I think there's something to be said about that. I'm not going to place... I really admire young people. They're doing lots of really interesting things. I got a 27-year-old. He's got opportunities and possibilities that I could never have dreamed of. On the other hand, by God, wake up, smell the coffee. Let's do one more because I know you have a flight to catch. Thanks. Uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, the question I have is the scariest comment that I think has been made during by any candidate in this election is the statement by Donald Trump that he would negotiate our debt. Uh, against, uh, like he did w as a businessman, yeah. you know, going bankrupt, and that the full faith and credit of the United States is somehow subject to negotiation. Yeah, well, what it is troubling. It is troubling. And he said it last weekend, and I, I put something uh, in a column for FoxNews.com about it because I find it deeply troubling. But think about this: twice in the last eight years, the President of the United States and the Secretary of Treasury have both said that unless certain things were done in Congress they would renegotiate our debt. They were playing politics with the debt ceiling. And they twice did it. And I was horrified at that. Uh, the full faith and credit of the United States is something that is valuable. We're the reserve currency of the world. You want to see us beggared and turned into a third world country, take away our status as a reserve currency of the world, and have somebody say, well, the euro or the yuan or fill in the blank, the Mexican peso, the Venezuelan peso, is a more reliable currency than the United States of America. I thought it was appalling by Trump, but I also thought it was appalling when the Treasury Secretary and the President of the United States said so over the last eight years. On that cheery note, can we end on a better question than that? I mean, not to, no disrespect, give but us, something positive and optimistic. Give us an upbeat question. Who's got an upbeat question? You notice they immediately took their hands and pulled them down. <laughs> All right. Give us a good one. You know what? I disagree. Thanks for the optimistic end. Uh, seriously. <laughs> I really admire this guy. I got to work with him when I was in the White House. When we were pushing Social Security reform, we ran into resistance more from Republicans than we did from Democrats. Because the Tom DeLays of the world and before him Newt Gingrich's had said, don't touch this. Stay away from it. It's political dynamite. And Ryan was a guy who got it. He said, we've got to, these are great social safety networks, which are absolutely vital to our country for so many people, but they don't mean anything if they're frayed and broken. And he was willing to talk about this, as was another guy who's a Democrat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And to me, this was a terrible lesson. Moynihan was in ill health when he took the chairmanship of the Social Security Reform Commission, and shortly after its final report, he died. If he had been alive and been able to go to the Hill as a Democrat 
and say this is a, an idea that we as Democrats can support, progressive indexing. That was our proposal, it was Moynihan's proposal. What it said was, we will guarantee a check that is equal or great, that is greater in purchasing power than the check that you would get if you were retired today, except for the top 1%, and their check will be equal in purchasing power to what it is. We'll basically guarantee the people at the bottom third of the wage scale, mostly the promise that Social Security has today, that it can't hold for everybody. The me people in the middle third will get most of what the promise is, but every one of their checks is going to be bigger in purchasing power when they retire than it would be in purchasing power if they were retired today. And then the, the top third of wage earners will get a significantly smaller increase over what they would get today. And the guys at the top, the 1% at the top, would get a Social Security check that would be equal in purchasing power than it is today. Because we all think, look, the average benefit today is about $13,000. We all think that when we retire, 2050 say, that the average check will be $13,000 adjusted for inflation. No. Because of the way we calculate Social Security, accelerated wages, the average check at the middle of the century in today's dollars will be $22,000. We put a lot less into Social Security today than we take out. And again, we're passing the bill on to our kids. So Ryan is a guy saying, let's do something about this. And I sense there are a growing number of people who are willing to do that. The other good news is Medicare. We know how to reform Medicare because we've done it. And Medicare prescription part D, the drug benefit. How many have got part D, drug benefit? Okay, passed in 2003. We had two competing plans. The Democrat plan said, we're gonna treat the drug benefit just like the rest of Medicare. Government will set the formulary, government will set the price, government will make the decisions, and we'll give you what you want, and the benefit will be unlimited. Price tag on that was $850 billion, according to the CBO. Al Gore had advocated that program in the 2000 election. Bush's program, which again, he advocated in the 2000 election, took a Democrat idea. An idea advanced under the Medicare Reform Commission and the Clinton administration by Senator John Bro of Louisiana, and he said, okay, let's give everybody a certain amount of money, premium support, to buy an insurance policy to meet their drug needs. Not everybody needs a lot of drugs, but people need insurance against drug costs. So let's give everybody a certain amount of money to support them in in, in buying a health insurance policy and let the private markets compete, put the consumer in charge and let everybody go out and compete for their business. Now we wanted to means test it, but nobody was for that. We barely passed it. The bill on that according to the CBO in the first 10 years of the full operation of the program was $450 billion, $400 billion less than, than the cost for the traditional Medicare benefit. Three bad things almost immediately happened. More people signed up for the program than anticipated. They signed up quicker, and the utilization rate was much higher. Technical term meaning how much they draw on it. And last year was the 10th anniversary of the program. It did not cost $450 billion. It cost 40% less. Because market forces and competition cause people to say, how can we deliver the benefit cheaper and better? Because we're competing with a bunch of other people who want the business of these people. And think about that. What would happen if we, the rest of, of, of Medicare had those same competitive and market forces involved in it that would keep costs down and cut the cost estimates? It's the only government-provided health benefit. Medicare, TRICARE, Medicaid, Indian Health Care, Champus, you name it. It's the only health benefit provided by the federal government that has come in under budget, and it's because it's the only government-provided health care benefit that puts the consumer in charge and relies upon private choices, private markets, private insurance, private providers. And the government is not in charge of pricing it. And that, to me, is hopeful, because what that says is with the right kind of leadership that's willing to say, hey, this is a good idea that the Democrats came up with, and Republicans put in, a, put in action, and let's find some way to get an agreement around this, we might be able to solve these two problems. Anyway, not the problems they were thinking about in 1896, but nonetheless, problems we ought to be thinking about in 2016. Thanks for having me. Thank you all. Thank you, Carl.